The national problem is fixated on the short-term issues when really this is our moment to solve the long-term problems in public education. All the conversations we're having in education are about the next three months. When are we going back in person? Where are our teachers on the priority list for vaccines? How are we grading students? Should we have state tests? How do I follow CDC's new color zones? Should we extend learning into the summer? I do not envy SEAs and superintendents right now. New federal funding is on the way. Biden has asked for $130 billion to help K-12 schools reopen their doors. More than double the dollars provided over two previous packages. It's a part of a larger pandemic relief package that congressional Democrats have fast-tracked. Approval could come as soon as early March. However, based on my conversations with dozens of superintendents and C-level administrators, their biggest fear to the solutions and funding is that they may not arrive until it's too late. It already feels like it's the start of the fourth quarter and we're down three touchdowns. And I'm just not sure if our time, money, and more inconsistencies are worth it to get back in the game. Biden's 100th day will be April 20th. College students graduate May 20th. Then high school students the following weeks. This simply seems like we're about to be done with this game. Now look, all of these topics are very necessary and important for logistics. Getting all the things we just listed right gets kids a month of maybe normalized learning, which they deserve. But if we have a real chance to solve the gaps in learning, it's going to be making the long-term revisions around these topics that need to start right now. We need more conversations around what does this pandemic experience mean for learning moving forward? How can we invest in our school models next year to be more engaging, flexible, collaborative with students and their families? I sat down with Dr. Michael Lubefeld, superintendent at North Shore School District 12 in Illinois. His schools went hybrid on the 1st of February and his teachers received the first shot of the vaccine on the 7th. They will get the second shot on the 28th. My name is Mike Lubefeld. I'm the superintendent of schools in North Shore School District 112. Uh, we're on the beautiful shores of Lake Michigan, north of Chicago and south of the Wisconsin border. We're uh, located in Highland Park, Illinois. We serve children in Highland Park, Highwood, the town of Fort Sheridan, and we have military personnel who work at Naval Station Great Lakes. I'm not going to say we're going to get back to normal because normal was bad for so many kids and teachers. Never we're going to go back to normal. We're going to recreate reality. So number one, our teachers showed us they can adapt like lightning fast. Now, ideally, we have uh, more time for training and support and experimentation, um, but my goodness, we can change as needed, number one. Number two, what if a child is out sick and they've got, like, you know, um, even from a virus to a chronic disease, they don't have to A, miss school anymore, B, they don't have to just do worksheets at home and try to catch up with the class, and C, they don't even need an at-home tutor necessarily. We now have the wherewithal, the confidence, the ability, and some real technology acumen that we can provide constant, continuous learning, whether it's on-site brick and mortar, whether it's on-site virtual, whether it's at home virtual, or even if it's in the hospital. So I think you've mm. seen and I've seen that we can do it, and there's a lot we can do better. That's going to be a huge silver lining. Superintendent Lubefeld is the co-moderator of the monthly superintendent Twitter chat with Dr. Nick Poliak, and he and Poliak co-authored the book, The Unlearning Leader, Leading for Tomorrow Schools Today, which sounds like the perfect resource for what leaders are addressing right now. I asked Dr. Lubefeld, what is his thoughts on student flexibility and how he is looking to his schools moving forward? So in District 112, we have 10 schools. We have two middle schools, seven elementary schools, and a preschool. Every summer, we run a summer program. So let's just say that's an 11th school, right? Uh, in mm -hmm. our world, I think you might see me create an online learning academy. Now, it's not been defined. I don't know what you know who's funding it or whatever, but maybe we have a 12th school in our structures, in our norm, in the boxes that we live in, but that online academy has fluid enrollment. Maybe it's multi-age, multi-grade. Maybe mom and dad have a job in... Um, you know, Denmark. And instead of the child disenrolling, if we can get some flex and some grace on rules, maybe it's best to keep the children with their cohort of peers and friends rather than change. Maybe not. Um, maybe we've got a situation with a military deployment and we can keep the family connected this way. Maybe we've got a tragedy 
and someone's got to go live with a relative because of some just awful situation in the home. And instead of having them deal with more trauma, maybe we can reduce trauma by having some connectivity with our schools. My goodness, the opportunities are endless and we've just got to think differently um, dare I say, we need to unlearn. During our conversation, we did not just talk about the flexible schooling, but also the flexibility and staffing and what it means to support students at a public school. We have a family engagement specialist here in our school district. And one of the discussions was, should the person even have work hours? You know what I'm saying? Should, should their hours be noon to eight? I don't know. What if someone needs them at five in the morning? So we're starting to have conversations like there may be non-traditional roles that need to have different hours. And we just need to be, you know, flexibilized or, you know, fle flex it out. Um, maybe our school social workers don't need to be tied to the specifics of the collective bargaining agreement, you know, in terms of a union contract. Contracts are the law, not a suggestion. But maybe we need to negotiate some flexibility there and say, I'm the community counselor and I work from 4 p.m. to midnight. And again, I think we've got to open our eyes to the fact that the model of schooling that has been in place for a century may or may not have served us well and served us beautifully. The time though now is to address now. In Illinois, to give you an example, we've got about 2 million school children in public schools, ages three to about 18. 50% of those children are reported to be living in poverty. Right there, that's different than it was a century ago. Poverty has needs that involve trauma. Poverty has needs that involved um, irregular work hours. Poverty has needs that may not be neatly found between nine and three. So I applaud the question and sort of the prodding. Well, you're the public schools. Do you just work from nine to three? And the answer has to be no, we, we, we need to work differently. Um, and I think that this opportunity of the pandemic that has brought my folks and our staff into the living rooms of our families has now broken new ground. Now we're there. Maybe we, you know, pull back a little bit and, and do some, um, a greater degree of brick and mortar, but we're in the living room. Let's maximize the good part of that now. There will be two types of districts next year, and it all depends how we respond to this pandemic school year. How do we create a more flexible school day, a more engaged student population, and more holistic 360 support that are there for students when they need us most? COVID-19 came and pulled a rug from under our feet and we've been trying to tread water ever since. To be honest, it's been remarkable how we've been able to adapt so quickly. But the next big leap is the difference between districts that thrive and districts that suffer, is how do they make their schools better because of the pandemic? I'm not just talking about online parent nights and virtual academies, because if that's all you get, you're definitely missing the boat. The pandemic came and it gave us a glimpse to the future, and we now know what we have to build toward in order to survive. House Democrats advanced a bill last week which will allow $129 billion to be used for a variety of reopening measures, such as repairing ventilation systems and reducing class sizes to allow students to socially distance. The measure also includes a requirement that districts use 20% of their funding to mitigate pandemic-related lost learning, which means it's time to get creative on how we support students. Thank you for watching This Week in Education. Please subscribe and share with your peers. In the meantime, keep changing the world.